Hi again, everyone. Patrick Fingston here. I write the Illinois political newsletter, which you can read at theillinois.com, I-L-L-I-N-O-I-Z-E.com. Thanks for joining us again on our semi-almost kind of weekly podcast. We're happy to be back uh, and a lot to talk about this week. Uh, coming up, we'll talk to Glenn Pichard, former congressman and 1998 Democratic nominee for governor. He was also president of Southern Illinois University. Uh, he has a new book out called Son of Southern Illinois. We'll talk to uh, the congressman about his uh, his memories and history and in state politics and maybe where today's politics are going. Uh, some interesting comments from him coming up. And, and then, of course, there's the, the big news of the week, which is the, the trial of Tim Mapes, who was the chief of staff uh, for 20 some years to former House Speaker Michael Madigan. Uh, Mapes was convicted this week of uh, perjury and obstruction of justice in federal court in Chicago. The the interesting part of that is that uh, Mapes had already been essentially fired by Madigan. He resigned, but but he was told to resign uh, in in the summer of 2018. Uh, and in a uh, grand jury testimony some three years later, uh, Madigan or Mapes, who had immunity, perjured himself and was convicted in just a few hours of jury deliberation uh, this week. And now he faces up to 25 years in prison uh, because he tried to protect Madigan. It was it was really an interesting uh, trial for those who were following it. And and I, I wrote a story on the, the newsletter uh, in the newsletter a couple of weeks ago as the trial started that that it's really hard to try perjury uh, cases because you can't get into someone's head that that it's hard to say specifically that that if someone says, I don't recall something, that they were specifically lying to you. I don't recall what I had for lunch yesterday. That doesn't mean that I don't actually have it somewhere in the recesses of my brain. It's just that I don't recall what I had for lunch yesterday. So so is it possible that that McLean forgot these these conversations or or what he knew about what Mike Madigan and Mike McLean were scheming in the background? And, and it was really interesting that, that when uh, prosecutors went through the, the lies that, Ma- that Mapes was alleged to have made in the, uh, in the grand jury testimony, they tore it apart bit by bit. Uh, we'll talk more about the Mapes trial with, uh, with Ray Long from the Chicago Tribune coming up. Uh, first, though, I, I want to share with you some of those uh, some of those pieces of evidence from federal court in the Mapes case. Prosecutors outlined seven specific lies Mapes made to the grand jury that he either claimed he didn't recall something or purposely misled prosecutors related to former House Speaker Michael Madigan and his close confidant and agent Michael McLean. Here's a portion of grand jury testimony and wiretaps that led prosecutors and eventually the jury to believe Mapes was lying. In his March 2021 grand jury testimony, Mapes was asked if McLean had told Mapes the kind of conversations he was having with the speaker. Did Mr. McLean, after he retired, kind of give you any insight into what his interactions with Mr. Madigan were that you weren't privy to personally? No, that wouldn't that wouldn't happen. But in a recorded conversation between McLean and Mapes in November 2018, McLean told Mapes about the detailed conversations he was having with the speaker. Are you free tomorrow morning? Uh, hold on a minute. Yes, in the morning, why? Because uh, I'd like to have a little bit more of a substantive conversation with you about my some of my discussions with him last night. Yeah. yeah okay. you, 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 if you have a time, just tell me and I'll sort of find the moment. Um, I'll try to call you uh, between 8.30 and 9. That's fine. So I'm not doing something else. That's all I care about. Right. Okay. Okay. Yep. The 2021 grand jury asked if McLean would tell Mapes about the work he was doing on Madigan's behalf. Mapes told the grand jury he would not have had that information. And Mr. McLean didn't, wouldn't tell you what he was discussing with Mr. Madigan or uh, anything that he was doing on behalf of Mr. Madigan in that 17, 18, 19 time frame? No. But in an October 2018 wiretap, McLean specifically discusses assignments from Madigan. 
you know, one of my assignments is to tell Lou Lang that he has no uh, life in the house anymore. Yeah, yeah, and you had one discussion with him. Did you have more? Well, I, I'm doing it by tears. Mapes told the grand jury in 2021 that he wouldn't know what McLean was doing on Madigan's behalf. Do you have any knowledge about whether or not Mr. McLean performed any sort of tasks or assignments for Mr. Madigan in the 2017 to 2018 time frame at all? Uh, I don't recall any. But a July 2018 wiretap showed McLean directly laying out another assignment for Madigan. Hi, Timothy. Hi, Michael. How are Thank you, Sheila. I'm okay. Are you still driving? Yeah, oh, yeah. I had to... You remember Tony Abenanti? Yes. So he wanted to have breakfast with me, so I stopped in Geneva and had breakfast with him. And then I, I, I'm on a, an assignment regarding Sam Yingling. What is he going to do regarding Speaker Mike Madigan and voting for him? He's against so. me. <laughs> and so... But Sam Yingling's against everything, isn't he? Except what he wants. Prosecutors asked Mapes in his grand jury testimony if anyone had described McLean's work for Madigan. Has anyone ever described to you, again, we're talking about this, some, all these questions that are, are going to come are for the 2017 uh, through 2019 time frame. Do you recall anyone ever describing any work, anyone at all, describing any work or assignments Mr. McLean was performing on Mr. Madigan's behalf? Yeah, I don't recall that that I would have had been part of any of that dialogue. I don't know why I would be. So the answer is yes or no to that question. Do you recall? No, I don't recall any of that. But it turns out in December 2018, McLean directly detailed conversations with Madigan, which were caught on federal wiretaps. You know how Mike is. He went through all the requests line by line, and then he went through um, his feelings that... Um, if you're in leadership, you should not be a chair this time. And um, and um, and um, it's about 45 minutes into the conversation. And so then I asked, like, well, what's the next step? I mean, should we each have our own ideas and send them to Jessica? And Madigan said yes, but um, Jessica then interrupted and said, well, I'd like to get some things put together, and then I'll send them out to everybody. And then we'll set up another conference call. Hmm. Whatever that means. <clears throat> that, well, happened, that happened Sunday morning. Prosecutors asked if Mapes had any idea if McLean was an agent for Madigan. So one of the things we were trying to figure out, uh, Mr. Uh, Mapes, is whether or not uh, kind of a key issue for us is whether or not Mr. McLean acted as an agent for Mr. Madigan in any respect. Um, including that time frame I'm talking about, the 2017, 2018, 2019 time frame. Are you aware of any facts that would help us understand uh, whether or not, in fact, Mr. McLean acted as an agent or performed work for Mr. Madigan or took direction from Mr. Madigan in that time frame? Uh, I don't know who you would go to other than Mr. Madigan and Mr. McLean. Um, it, uh, Mr. Madigan, if he had th people do things for him, like I did things for him, was uh, didn't distribute information freely. So he had a tight kind of grip on information about what was going on in his operation? Uh, on, on things that he had an interest in, very much so. Okay. And so to your understanding, Mr. McLean was outside that kind of close circle of uh, information as it related to Mr. Madigan? No, I didn't say that. What I meant is either those two people would know. I don't think that my replacement uh, as chief of staff, uh, Jessica Basham, or Mary Morsey on the political side, if they would have knowledge of that, because I don't think they'd be part of the discussion. I wasn't part of after 20 years. But in a March 2019 wiretap, McLean himself referred to him as an agent for Madigan when talking to Mapes. I just am uh, picking up on notes from others. It just makes me think that not, I'm not saying he's against me. I didn't say that. But to say that eh, he's on the same page. So, okay, that's fine. No, I think I, 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 the way he, he talks to me, I think he is. Okay. Well, then his agents are. Not you, others. Agents are. Yeah, well, don't pay attention to those agents. They're immature. No, I get that. I just, it's all about going through all kinds of pieces of stuff. You know, that's what yeah, it is. Right, right, right.
All right, let's uh, let's do some more here on the uh, MAPES verdict uh, yesterday in federal court. Uh, it's Friday morning as we bring in Ray Long, uh, Chicago Tribune political reporter who is uh, all things uh, Madigan beat and MAPES beat and has spent a lot of time in, in federal court in the last few weeks. Um, uh, Ray, I, I have to assume that you were as unsurprised uh, at the verdict as I was, especially the way the the federal government just kind of systematically dismantled MAPES's I forgot argument. Right. It was uh, really a mountain of evidence that the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office poured uh, onto this case. They um, went, as you said, systematically through each of the seven lies that were outlined in the indictment that uh, led to his perjury charge. Uh, each of those seven lies the jury said were proven up they only had to prove one they only had to prove one of uh, more than a dozen uh, instances that showed uh, attempted obstruction of justice and they uh, checked the boxes on on that too and so they really did not give the uh, defense much credit for anything the defense uh, was not long and entangled, and uh, they did not uh, offer that much of it of an overall defense because uh, they relied on kind of obfuscation. They relied on trying to distract the jurors from the core uh, charges of the. Uh, prosecution. And uh, really, uh, Patrick, the thing is that some of these questions that Mapes said he couldn't recall were things that uh, people in Springfield uh, were generally aware of. Uh, things like, was uh, Mike McLean, a longtime confidant of Mike Madigan, a guy who uh, took assignments from Madigan and carried out different tasks for Madigan. And uh, McLean uh, himself was on tape talking about them, but he has been talking about these types of things for years. So at one, one point, uh, the prosecution said uh, uh, Tim Mapes uh, is acting like he was the only guy in Springfield who didn't know McLean was taking uh, work for Madigan or doing things for Madigan. This is the thing that that just shocks me the most. The the Mapes grand jury testimony, which, by the way, he was given full immunity as long as he told the truth. Right. Um, he he knew we all knew by was it March of 2021, uh, March or April, whenever they actually did the sit down with the, the grand jury. Yeah, March. Yeah. We all knew that Mike McLean had been wiretapped. Right. And that was that was public. It, it was common knowledge at that point. Right. How do you not know? I mean, he knew he had phone calls with McLean. You have to assume that the government had those. Is is this uh, Tim Mapes isn't a stupid guy. So so what is this? Is this arrogance? Is this not understanding? I just don't understand why. Right. I, I think that's the biggest mystery here. Why try to. Uh, outsmart the grand jury and the federal prosecutors. But a lot of people ha have thought Mapes over the years was the kind of guy who thought he was the smartest guy in the room. And uh, he went ahead and accepted immunity and then uh, thought that he could get away by saying he didn't uh, remember things or didn't recall things. And um, the prosecution uh, told the jury in the closing arguments uh, that he was just using this I don't remember, I don't recall shtick as a, an excuse uh, to try to not answer anything that came close to the relationship of Madigan and McLean. The prosecution called it the third rail, Mike McLean being uh, Madigan's longtime confidant. And of course, um, this was just driven home repeatedly by the prosecution the the idea here that 
the the lies that he told also weren't covering up criminal activity. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, did you ever hear Mike McLean say, I want to do this or this or this for, for ComEd or for the speaker? He, he, he didn't, he didn't uh, alleged or he didn't try to cover up any lies. These, these were essentially like foundational facts. So I, I'm just, I know that he wants to protect the speaker. The speaker was his guy, but the speaker had thrown him overboard two years before. It, it just, I, I'm, I'm just, I don't understand. And maybe, maybe you guys have a better sense of, of being in the courtroom and, 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 you know, Tim hasn't returned my call, which you can't, you can't blame him, but is there any sense of what the motivation was? Well, uh, the prosecution said it was loyalty and that he put, uh, loyalty to Madigan over uh, the truth. And the reality is that uh, he was still working uh, to help the, the, the boss, as he called Madigan, and to help uh, the House Democrats. And he was working a lot with Mike McLean over the telephone, over things as uh, minute as, uh, you know, who should be on what committee when they were passing out committee assignments uh, beginning at, at the beginning of the 2019 session. And to your uh, point about recording, uh, we broke the story that Mike McLean had been recorded back in November 2019. So he had two years to know that the recordings had been going on and he had to have known at some point that they likely included him on some of these calls. So uh, your point is is well taken. And the reality is uh, Mapes just uh, still wanted to be part of the Madigan team. He didn't want to do anything that would hurt uh, his uh, former boss. And to the idea that he got tossed, um, out. He was uh, accused of uh, years of sexual harassment and fostering a, a culture of sexism and bullying and harassment uh, in uh, June of 2018. Within three hours, Madigan dumped him from the team. There is kind of an understanding by a lot of these loyalists that if you uh, hurt the bus, you have to take the fall. And it looked like uh, Mapes was willing to, to take a fall to the ultimate uh, to in the grand jury. And to your point also, uh, Patrick, that uh, he didn't talk about uh, any type of, of uh, illegal activity. Uh, he doesn't have to in a setting where he's sworn to tell the truth and given immunity. If he's lying on anything, which the prosecution, uh, like you said, systematically took apart his lies and shredded them. Uh, if he's lying on anything, they can uh, swing at him, take a swing at him uh, for perjury. And they did that. And the lies uh, about not recalling this or that all added up to an unwillingness to cooperate in the in the case and uh, the uh, prosecution viewed that as obstruction of justice they charged him only with attempted obstruction of justice and uh, they uh, were able to uh, convince the jury uh, that yes indeed there were were many many facets of this investigation and of this uh, trial that Mapes failed to disprove. So, so what happens next? I mean, obviously, you know, Mapes isn't going to spend 24 years in prison or whatever it is. Right. The, the, the logic would tell you that the feds are going to try and turn him around, make him a witness, but he's already lied under oath once he's, he's given them no incentive to, uh, to work with him. Is is there any chance that the feds want him in the Madigan trial at this point? Well, I think they would take if he suddenly uh, decided to uh, tell tell all if he knows uh, 
things to tell. Uh, I, he, he's got some real hard decisions to make. Can he do that or can he not? He's looking at, at uh, likely prison time, even though he has a clean record at, up to this point, uh, which the judge would take into account. Uh, he's a first time offender, so there are the chances of him getting a maximum sense of sentence are really, really small. But the idea of, of facing prison at all is something that's going to make him uh, think about whether he should speak up uh, to the grand jury about things he, he may know that may help them buttress their case against Madigan. Uh, the reality is there have been guys over the years who have uh, taken the bullet for their for their boss and gone to prison. And uh, this may be another case like that. If he f does flip and the prosecution uses him on the stand, then the uh, the defense for Madigan would be that he's a, a convicted liar. He's, he's he was convicted of perjury. So uh, you have to take into consideration if you if you get a guy like that on the stand, uh, how credible will he be? And if he, even if he is credible, he'll be vulnerable to an attack. Other than potential testimony, which, which as we've just said, is, is a, a, a coin flip at this point. Yeah. What impact does this conviction have on Madigan's pending trial for next spring? Well, I think it gives momentum to the prosecution. I think that also it could mean that people who were on the fence on whether they were going to help out the prosecution or were thinking maybe they could uh, be called in uh, to testify against Madigan and maybe they could, uh, uh, you know, kind of skate through uh, a, a bunch of uh, answers with I don't recall. I think it, it will show them that they're not going to get away with it if the prosecution thinks you're lying. So you better tell the straight up truth. And if you've got something that the, the feds are trying to get out of you now and uh, you've gone before the grand jury, you might want to consider straightening out your story because this reinforces the idea that the feds will come after you if you don't cooperate. So every every statement that, that landed in my inbox after the, the verdict Thursday, which were all from Republicans, by the way, not a single yeah. Democrat in my inbox, uh, they they were all about ethics reform, uh, which is is, you know, a, a, an issue Republicans have been harping on for a sure. long time. I've written plenty of ethics reform statements in, in my day, but yeah. Uh, this has nothing to do with ethics reform. This was a guy who lied under oath. This was perjury and obstruction. So uh, legislatively, I know that, and, and you've got, we can put your, your political reporter cap on here, that uh, I, I know Maurice West has had his eyes on, on some ethics reform legislation. Mm -hmm. They pushed it back to potentially for veto session, but you know, there, there are still a lot of Democrats that don't want to move on anything significant. Should, you know, will this have any impact on, on ethics reform and what could we see? Well, I think it gives the uh, proponents of reform another argument to say, look, this is a mess. There have been five people in, uh, convicted in this uh, uh, madigan McLean investigation already, and uh, the conviction of perjury is not uh, the same thing as getting convicted as on racketeering and bribery, et cetera, but that it is a part of the, the grand investigation. It, the lies were basically a cover-up, and so the Cover up was about things that that uh, maybe could be addressed partly in legislation. Uh, the ethics laws in Illinois have always been loose, despite their attempts to tighten them over the the recent years. There's still uh, 
kind of uh, the, the type of, of laws and, and rules that have uh, big holes in them. And don't forget who makes those over the years. The people who have to abide by these rules are the people who, who make the laws. And uh, it is one of those things where weak laws uh, give lawmakers the incentive to look for ways to get around them and maybe they should uh, consider shutting down some of those uh, open doors that uh, allow people to to jump around the lines or jump over the lines if there isn't any uh, consequence to to uh, violation the great ray long from the chicago tribune uh, ray appreciate your time as always uh, if you, you're writing throughout this case and this trial has been spectacular. Uh, so, so thank you for your hard work. Thanks for all you do. And thanks for taking a few minutes with us. Thank you, Patrick. Always good to be here, man. Thanks to our friend Ray Long for joining us. I uh, always appreciate his insight. He's one of the best in the game and we're, we're happy to have him. Uh, let's, let's turn now to our conversation with Congressman, former Congressman, uh, former candidate for governor, Glenn Pichard. We're pleased now to be joined by former Congressman, 1998 Democratic nominee for governor in Illinois, and the former president of Southern Illinois University, uh, Congressman Glenn Pichard, uh, who joins us from Southern Illinois. Uh, we're recording on on, uh, on Wednesday, uh, Congressman, where I, I'm sure it's as hot down there as it is here. So appreciate you taking some time for us uh, today and, and talking through uh, things and related to your new book, Son of Southern Illinois. Uh, let's start with what wanted you. What what led you to want to write a book? Well, Patrick, I think you know various folks had spoken to me about it. Um, I'd been a state senator and uh, U.S. congressman and candidate for governor, and then I became uh, vice chancellor over at SIU Carbondale for administration and, and chaired the board of trustees for the university and then became the president of the university system. And so there were folks in the SIU press that felt that uh, my life story was maybe worthy of telling. And, and so um, I had uh, become a friend uh, with a Carl Walworth, who is a former editor and publisher of the Charleston and Mattoon newspapers. Uh, and um, Carl was writing books in his retirement, and we had lunch together, and, and the thoughts for the books just came out of that. Uh, what What's your biggest memory in terms of the way things have changed? You know, I, I first started getting around the political world in 2005, which feels, you know, as almost 20 years ago, as it feels like a lifetime ago. I mean, you... You know, you went to the Senate in in eighty four. I mean, it's 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 a, a a completely different world, right? It is a completely different world. Um, uh, I don't know how to explain it, and I don't know exactly what's happened. To be honest with you, but when I was in the Illinois State Senate, um, uh, Phil Rock, who was the Democrat president of the Senate, and Jim Thompson, uh, who was the uh, uh, Republican governor, uh, would go out to dinner a couple times a week, have a couple of beers. If there were hugely controversial uh, issues, uh, they would sit down uh, in their friendship with each other and sort of iron them out and come back to the caucus. And uh, Rock would say, uh, on this bill coming up, this is what the Republicans are going to get. This is what we're going to get. And we came to some middle ground and went forward. And the same thing happened when I went to Congress. Um, Tom Foley and uh, Bob Michael, who was a wonderful uh, Republican uh, uh, minority spokesman in the House, had a great friendship. Uh, they, you know, when, when there were bills of consequence that we needed to have a meeting ground on, uh, they would meet, sort of come to an agreement, bring them back to the caucuses, and we would work through it and move forward. But it seems like today, and I don't know when this actually began, but it seems like today they don't want to talk to each other. There's no middle ground. Uh, when I was a, a high school teacher teaching history, I would draw a line on the blackboard and I would say, you know, uh, here's laissez-faire, ultra-liberal government out here on this end. 
where folks pretty much do whatever they want to do, however they want to do it, whenever they want to do it. And over here is more authoritarian, you know, uh, government, usually with a strong person at the top, you know, and right here in the middle is democracy. And I said, sometimes we're slightly right of center. Sometimes we're slightly left of center, according to the will of the American people. But we don't dwell out here on the extremes. And that's the way American government has always been to me until maybe the last I don't know, 10 years when we've decided to give those folks on the extreme a broader voice. And a lot of the media just sort of runs to those folks. Yeah. You know, I've always said that, that Trump is more of a, a an effect than a cause um, that, <laughs> that that really the uh, I mean, you were there in Congress in 1994 yeah. with when the contract with America and the way Newt Gingrich started to do things. Yeah. You know, Fox News started in 96. MSNBC was right around there, too. You know, it, it, it's it's clear that that it, it's it's been a downhill, um, you know, downhill fall in in our discourse since since at least then. Um what what do you think that that main reason is in Southern Illinois? I mean, it wasn't that long ago that that you had, you know, multiple state legislators. You still had, you know, a Democratic congressman, yeah. um, you know, and and essentially from on the the state and 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 federal levels in Southern Illinois today, Democrats don't exist. Um, what what led? Uh, Southern Illinois to go from a very, you can almost say Dixiecrat level territory to to one that is such a Republican stronghold today? Well, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, Southern Illinois had traditionally benefited from the Roosevelt uh, programs, WPA and CCC camps that built the Shawnee National Forest and the road system down here and so on. So there'd been a lot of benefits to those programs, the REA that had uh, brought electricity to the rural areas. But in the last uh, election, beginning with uh, President Trump, uh, he, he came to, if I remember this correctly, he came to Evansville, Indiana. He came to Cape Girardeau, Missouri. He came to Southern Illinois to the airport, three miles from my home. He came to Granite City. He came with visits from completely surrounded Illinois, uh, Southern Illinois and that was indicative of the Republican Party's concentration on the rural areas of this country. And I think that's still their focus. And as they began to build in the rural areas, particularly Southern Illinois, the Democrat Party in Illinois became more urbanized and more focused in getting the, the suburbs to join the more urban center of Chicago. And I think downstate, uh, uh, got ignored in the process, and many Democrats down here, uh, it's no secret that uh, union members and a lot of the major unions probably voted 60, 70 percent with Donald Trump. Um, they had felt, for whatever reason, that the Democrats weren't continuing to support their efforts as they had in the past, and, and Trump stepped into that vacuum. It's it's really, you know, it's interesting that the you mentioned the uh, the union folks because uh, there was a, a story this week that uh, a state representative from from Ottawa, Lance Ednock, uh, announced that he's not running for re-election. Uh, he's a a, a union operator uh, that that kind of got into the politics because of Bruce Rauner's union opposition, um, and and he's essentially said that, and I'm boiling this down, but essentially said that. That the progressives have have made it hard for moderates to get anything done, and uh, that the Democrats have, are having a hard time connecting with downstaters. Sherry Busto said the same thing when I talked to her a couple of weeks ago. How do you see that? Why are Democrats, if if you if you agree, Democrats are having a hard time connecting? Why? Oh. Why? Why is why is that message not working downstate? Patrick, I, you know, I I can give you my opinion, going back to my race for governor, um, my whole life, uh, I've, I've been a solid Democrat. Uh, I have always uh, believed in the principles as they were taught to me growing up at the Democrat Party, 
equal justice under the law, balance the budget, don't borrow and spend on the backs of the children, you know, um, support unions, protect the vulnerable, those kinds of principles. Um, and, and, but, but all my life, uh, through my time uh, in the part, local party here in the county, uh, going up through the state Senate days in Congress, uh, just about every candidate that I endorsed, went out and supported, knocked on doors and so on, were in the liberal wing of the Democrat Party. Um, I grew up in a family, in a faith, um, that believed in the pro-life position. It wasn't something I proselytized uh, for. I believe it's every individual's right to make that decision on their own. But when I ran for governor and won the primary, it was the progressive end of the Democrat Party that held that one position against me to the point of not being able to support me. And uh, I lost uh, probably the race for governor. I think I lost primarily because of my position on that issue. Um, so, you know, all my life, I had supported progressive uh, issues, and uh, but yet when, as a moderate Democrat, I needed the progressive uh, in wing of the party to get behind me. I think I could have won had that happened. They couldn't, uh, and um, I, I think that's, you know, those kind of one issue litmus test are dangerous for a party. Um, there are, and I say this in my book, there are millions of pro-life Democrats throughout this country who feel like, you know, they don't have a place to go really when it comes to that issue. Uh, and, um, and, and, and they're good Democrats. They, they, they're not trying to subvert anything or force anybody to take a position the way they believe. But, you know, uh, do they deserve to be deserted when they run for office and uh, they need that progressive wing to get behind them the way they have gotten behind the progressive wing over the years? You know, it's it's problematic. There's no question about it. You know, we, we've seen there's polling out there that, that makes it clear that the majority of Americans are somewhere in the middle on abortion, either... Yeah pro-life with exceptions or, or pro-choice with right. restrictions. Right. Um, but that doesn't seem to be where your party is anymore. And that, 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 uh, that position, you know, is being pro-life at all seems like it's not a welcome position in the democratic party. Do you, do you feel like there's a place for pro-life among the democratic party anymore? Well, yeah, I do because I have to look at, the Democrat Party, I have to look at myself and, and look at my background and experience and the votes that I've cast over the years on balance. And on balance, uh, I greatly support uh, uh, the principles of the Democrat Party. Uh, the fact that I have, you know, can't support every one of those principles ought not be a reason for me to be rejected by the you know, the broad uh, rank and file of the Democrat Party, but it is, and um, uh, that's regrettable, but I, I, I suppose the Republican Party has the same kind of, of uh, issues between their members. Do you feel like a moderate Democrat can get the, the nomination for president or governor anymore? No, I don't. Um, I don't feel that way. Uh, uh, one of my... Uh, dear friends, a uh, professor of political science at the university here, uh, it, you know, I don't think a moderate Democrat uh, could, could get the nomination. Um, it would be too divisive in the party right now. But by the same token, um, my friend, the political science professor here at the university maintains that even Paul Simon could not get elected in Southern Illinois right now because it has turned so red um, uh, because of the focus of the Republican Party on the rural areas and the appeal of the Republican Party to the rural areas. 
I mean, Sheila, you know, couldn't couldn't win races, you know, in in yeah. in Southern Illinois, and she was she was, I think, would would most people would agree was more more progressive than her father, but um, yeah. you know, still uh, the the name ID goes a long way, and especially with a name like Simon. Well, the 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 um, uh, I'm state central committee person for the Democrat Party in this congressional district, and. Um, we looked at a lot of the political advertisement in this congressional district last time. And the, the political advertisement for the Republican Party was simply this. If they have a D by their name, don't vote for them. And that was the message. It wasn't anything about issues or differences of issues. It was, if they've got a D by their name, don't vote for them. And that's the message that went out on social media. It's a message that went out in advertisements and, you know, uh, issues didn't seem to matter. Uh, it was just which party are you with? And if you're with the Democrat Party, don't vote for them. You know, I'm, I'm a downstate or two, you know, from from uh, farther north than you, but, um, you know, still still south of Chicago. And and, you know, I, I come from a 75 percent Republican county. I think Darren Bailey won 78 percent in my home county. Uh, Iroquois County in, in 2022, you know, I, I, I know that there were down, down your way too. There's, there's a lot of uh, anger toward JB Pritzker downstate. Um, how would you rate the job he's doing? And, and do you, do you, how do you under, how do you, how do you line up? Do you, do you understand the frustration with him downstate? What, what do you see as the, the reasoning there? Well, the, the reason that there's frustration is uh, uh, because of his position on those cultural issues. Uh, and and that's, that's the reason. But, you know, he has been an excellent governor. He's, he's done more for Southern Illinois in the time that he's been governor. He's, he's uh, put a poor district in Cairo that's going to, I think, economically revitalize that whole area. He's gone up the river and he's doing the same thing uh, in Gallatin County over in the Shawneetown area. He's put a, 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 a gambling boat out here in Williamson County uh, that's creating a lot of jobs here. Uh, he's been extraordinarily good to the university, a lot of, a lot of jobs there. Um, I, can, I can point to so many things that he has done down here as governor and you can't travel down here anywhere now without seeing road construction going on, bridge construction going on. You know, I, I think he's done an excellent job uh, for for this area particularly. But, you know, uh, the, the dissatisfaction with Pritzker, with Pritzker is the cultural issues. It's his stance on abortion. It's his, it's his stance on uh, changing some of the criminal justice laws those kinds of things. I wanted to, before we let you go, Congressman, I, I wanted to touch on higher education. You know, you spent time with SIU, president of SIU, well, uh, you know, uh, after you were in Congress. Um, it seems to me today that it is harder for a middle-class family to afford a college education, maybe than at any time, at least, you know, since since the civil war. Um, what, why is that? Why is it, why is it that it's so expensive and, 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 you know, you've seen, and this is maybe more a U of I issue than, than a, than an SIU issue where, where it's harder for in-state kids to get into, to the schools that they want to go. In some places it's cheaper for suburban kids to go to Iowa or Purdue or Michigan state or Wisconsin. Um, what, what what are the challenges facing higher ed today? Well, there's a lot of challenges, and I can speak specifically to Southern Illinois University in this area. We're the only university here that's surrounded on three sides by other major universities that live immediately across the borders into Kentucky, Missouri, and Indiana. So, you know, the, all of those states have much lower tuition. Uh, than Illinois has. Uh, and so a lot of kids from Southern Illinois are part of that 
outflux of students going to other states, to Southeast Missouri, to Murray State in Kentucky, to University of Southern Indiana. Um, so we always have that kind of competition. But if you look nationally at higher education, you will see that those kids coming from families of higher socioeconomic ability are gravitating toward the private universities or gravitating toward the universities of Illinois and the, the higher level public universities. A university like SIU or the other state supported universities in the state are, are being the choice of more middle and low income students today. So uh, the, the, the ability for those families to pay even to a university like SIU, which is much cheaper than say a U of I or a, certainly a Northwestern or University of Chicago, is much greater because mo uh, so many of our kids come from the middle and lower economic strata. It's, it's much more pressure on, on the families. Um, but I think, you know, if a, if a student is, uh, you know, if they'll research and they look at the federal assistance that's available, the state assistance that's available, uh, they can they can still go to college in Illinois with, with a fairly uh, a moderate uh, uh, debt when they get out. But it has increased. Everything has gone up in higher education, um, particularly research universities like ours here. Uh, it's very expensive. Is, is is there still, uh, does the two campus system at SIU still work, you know, in the long term? I mean, we've seen enrollment issues, you know, even some campus uh, rivalries between Edwardsville and Carbondale. Do, is, is, that, is that system still beneficial? Patrick, I think it is. I think uh, uh, each one of those uh, universities draw from the strengths of the other ones. There's a lot more collaboration now between the two universities than there ever has been. I, I think uh, the, the president and chancellors of the SIU system now in those two universities are real professional higher education people. And they've got an excellent board to work with. I, I, don't, I see that system getting even more strong. And, you know, you've got Edwardsville sitting on the edge of the Metro East area close to St. Louis. That's a favorable position for them. You've got Carbondale still maintaining a high research capacity in its university here. Uh, it, it's, I think they complement each other, and I think they're going to be stronger as, as, as they go along. Well, and for any of any people watching this who are, you know, north of I-70 who haven't been to Carbondale, I mean, it's... I visited in 2001 when I was a senior in high school and it was just blown away at how beautiful yeah. it was. So it's, you, you don't get that in a, a, a community college. <laughs> that's for sure. So sure. Uh, I'm putting you on the spot here. Any, any stories, any, any uh, anecdotes from the book that you'd like to share? Well, um, I guess my favorite chapter in the book is about chapter 26, I think. I had an interesting experience, uh, Patrick. Uh, when I when I was in the Illinois State Senate, uh, my Senate district was next to Senator Ralph's Dun Ralph Dunn's district. Ralph was Republican, I was Democrat. And my son, uh, uh, who was about 17 at the time, he rode up with us uh, one time to a session in Springfield. He just spent the week with me and so on. And, and he came to me not too long ago uh, while the book was being written. And he said, Dad, I don't understand. He said, the, the most enjoyable part of my trip uh, to Springfield with you was the ride up and back with you and Ralph Dunn. Because you guys, you, you know, I sat there and I listened to you guys joke about your constituents or talk about your bills. He said, you guys actually were so friendly and had so much fun together. He said, how did we get from you and Ralph Dunn to today? And um, so that little chapter uh, involves my thoughts on my son's question to me. What's happened? And uh, I explain uh, uh, why, why, I think, why I think we've come, you know, this distance apart. And so that, that's, that's an important part of the book 
to me. And of course, being raised in the hill country of uh, deep southern Illinois and uh, a lot of poverty and so on. And uh, my, my high school teachers, uh, my service in Korea, uh, when I worked in a, uh, a Korean orphanage there, uh, became a real important part of my experience. So I think those are parts of the book that I really enjoyed uh, writing about. The book is called Son of Southern Illinois. We popped it up on the screen there. Uh, Glenn Pichard's Life in Politics and Education. It's available on, on your Amazon machine. Uh, so uh, go and pick it up if, you, if you're interested. Uh, Congressman, it's a pleasure. Uh, I know you and your wife are continuing to do work with the Pichard Foundation for Abused Children, which uh, God bless you for that. Uh, we really do appreciate you and, and, and your, your conversation and your comments, and I uh, hope we can do it again sometime. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate your having me. You have a good day. It was an honor to uh, to have a chance to to sit down with with Congressman Pichard and and talk through uh, politics and some some third rail issues and uh, higher education as well. So I always appreciate his insight. What what you're always going to get from us here is a wide variety variety of opinions and thoughts and 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 you know we want to hear what a cross section of our our state and experts about our state have to stay, say about it. I you know I have some political opinions that don't fit into a a specific category and I share some of those uh, points and you can read our opinion stuff on the illinois.com but uh, but I like to talk to republicans, democrats, independents somewhere in between uh, because I think all voices should be heard and all voices should be challenged and and all voices uh, belong here. Because uh, that's how it should be. And that's what we're trying to do. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next time here on the Illinois Podcast.